We continue our coverage of the 20th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide. We go first to Washington, D.C., where we're joined by Emily Willard. She's a research associate at the National Security Archive, the organization's running the Rwanda 20 Years Later project, which is part of its broader genocide prevention project. Willard and her team are utilizing formerly classified documents released by the Defense Intelligence Agency to help bring accountability for the atrocity. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Emily. Start off by telling us what you have what you feel is the most important of the documents you've released? Um, I think the one of the most important documents that we've released um, is, uh, over the years, we've um, one of the key documents shows the, the U.S.'s and the international community's failure um, to intervene in Rwanda when the genocide was already occurring. There's um, a Department of Defense memo um, sent to the National Security Council. Um, it's a one-page, three-paragraph memo, memo um, clearly saying that there's a, an idea that um, the United States could jam um, the, the radios, the national radio program in Rwanda that were inciting the massacres. And um, this document clearly says that a decision was made that it would be ineffective and too expensive to jam the radios, um, and that it would be cheaper for the United States and more efficient to um, follow up after the violence had ended with aid support. Um, so this clearly shows U.S. apprehension in, in, in getting militarily involved um, and, you know, his going for the, the after-the-fact um, relief. Um, however, key, key I mean, the key, the key point here, for people who aren't familiar with this, is the role of the radio in the genocide, um, the uh, incitement to kill Tutsis, calling them, most famously, cockroaches. Yes. Yes. Um, and while this, this document um, is certainly key, and we've had this one um, for a while, the, the remaining key documents that really will tell the behind-the-scenes um, about how some of these key decisions were made are still, are still classified, and they're bogged down in the declassification process. So, unfortunately, some of the very key documents that we really need as an international community to understand how these key decisions were made are still not available to the public. And we're in the process of, of working with the government to get them declassified, but unfortunately, those key behind-the-scenes conversations are not available to the public. I want to go to some of the clips of U.S. officials. The United States government carefully avoided using the word genocide to describe what was happening in Rwanda. This is a clip from the PBS Frontline documentary, Ghosts of Rwanda. It begins with a State Department briefing, April 28, 1994. Comment on that or a view uh, as to whether or not what is happening could be genocide? Well, as I think you know, the, the use of the term genocide has a, a very precise uh, legal meaning, although it's not uh, strictly a, a, a legal determination. There are, there are other factors in there as well. Um, when in, in looking at a situation to make a determination about that, uh, before we, we begin to use that term, uh, we have to know so, uh, as much as possible about the, the facts of the situation. Out of curiosity, given that some, so many people say that there is genocide uh, underway or something that strongly resembles it, why wouldn't this convention be involved? Well, I think, as you know, this, this becomes a legal definitional thing, unfortunately, in terms of uh, as horrendous as all these things are, there becomes a definitional question. Madeleine Albright, then Secretary of State, speaking in 94, uh, seven weeks into the genocide, then President Bill Clinton restated U.S. policy on intervening in foreign conflicts. The end of the superpower standoff lifted the lid from a cauldron of long simmering hatreds. Now the entire global terrain is bloody with such conflicts from Rwanda to Georgia. Whether we get involved in any of the world's ethnic conflicts in the end must depend on the cumulative weight of the American interests at stake. That was President Clinton. Uh, during a press conference in June 94, Reuters correspondent Alan Ilsner questioned State Department spokesperson Christine Shelley and how she would describe the events taking place in Rwanda. We, we have every reason to believe that acts of genocide have occurred. How many acts of genocide does it take to make genocide? Um, Alan, that's just not a question that I'm in a position to answer. It's true that, the, uh, that you have specific guidance not to use the word genocide in isolation, but always to preface it with this, uh, with this word, acts of. 
Um, I have guidance which, um, which to which I, uh, which I try to use as best as I can. Um, I'm not. Uh, I, I have. Uh, there are, are formulations that we are using that we are trying to be consistent in our use of. That was the State Department spokesperson, Christine Shelley, being questioned by the Reuters correspondent, Alan Elsner. Scott Strauss is also with us now, in addition to Emily Willard. Scott Strauss is professor of political science and international studies at UW-Madison. He's written several books on Rwanda, including The Order of Genocide, Race, Power and War in Rwanda. Um, professor Strauss, the significance of the U.S. response at the time not willing to call what was happening a genocide? Well, the U.S. was one of the key actors at the time, and you know the clear, you know the policy was clearly not to get involved in Rwanda. But the U.S. and and as the leading actor on the international stage at that time, the U.S.'s actions were critical. But the U.S. wasn't acting alone. I mean, Britain, uh, and Belgium at that time, and within the bureaucracy of the United Nations, there was a real reluctance to get involved. And France as well, of course, um, leading to the fight that's happening today with the delegation, the high-level delegation, pulling out of the uh, genocide commemorations uh, because of Kogami saying that the French were responsible. Yeah, the, the French have a much more controversial history with Rwanda, uh, both before the genocide and even during the genocide. France was the leading ally of the of the regime in Rwanda, the regime that ultimately orchestrated the genocide. So the controversy is really how much did they know, when did they know, were they, some people accuse them of being involved in the preparations for genocide. I think that goes too far. But nonetheless, they were, they were the main ally of the regime that, that orchestrated genocide. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why their role has been so controversial in this particular history. In 2001, Samantha Power, now the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, wrote an article in The Atlantic magazine called Bystanders to Genocide. In it, she wrote, quote, the United States did much more than fail to send troops. It led a successful effort to remove most of the U.N. peacekeepers who were already in Rwanda. It aggressively worked to block the subsequent authorization of U.N. reinforcements. The United States, in fact, did virtually nothing to try to limit what occurred. In order not to appreciate that genocide or something close to it was underway, U.S. officials had to ignore public reports and internal intelligence and debate, she wrote. At the time, she was founding executive director of the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. Now, of course, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, and she is leading the U.S. delegation at the Rwandan commemorations. Emily Willard, the significance of this and the documents that you have uh, that um, are the underlying documents to the kind of statements you were hearing from President Clinton to Madeleine Albright, then the secretary of state. Yes, um, the the debate around whether or not the genocide had actually occurred um, was very clear right after the um, the plane was shot down and the violence started. There was a there was a debate going on with the Department of State, um, and uh, at the end of it wasn't until the the end of April that it was declared um, publicly that acts of genocide had occurred, and then not until the beginning of May. Um, that the Secretary of State came out and said that a genocide had occurred. Um, and you see in the documents the reporting um, within the State Department um, a very clear hesitation to not um, overestimate the number of people who were being killed. And actually, very interestingly, as the process of getting the documents declassified, um, there are examples where um, the United States in the in the document says we're not sure if you know 500,000 it is an exaggeration and in the first release of the document that that sentence was redacted because even after the genocide happened there's still a hesitation to be um, clear and open about what the intelligence was and how those um, that analysis of the intelligence was handled and the Dallaire facts, the significance of this, uh, Professor Strauss, if you could comment on this, the head of the U.N. peacekeepers writing to the United Nations that a genocide was about to take place. 
So I think that you know people have gone back and looked, and there have been clear warnings that something really terrible was happening, including the possibility of genocide or extermination. And the significance of the January uh, memo that Dallaire wrote was a, a clear warning to United Nations headquarters in New York that there were efforts to train militia, that there were stockpiling of weapons, there was a clear warning that there was going to be significant violence against uh, Tutsi civilians, even possibility of extermination. And Dallaire was essentially requesting some type of authorization to be uh, aggressive in, in uncovering those stockpiles of weapons and so forth. And the UN headquarters was essentially risk averse, said, don't do it, you know, don't get involved. And, um, and so this was a real early warning, a chance that uh, something could have happened before the genocide started in April, and the decision was not to do something. So I think the significance is, is a refusal to act on early warning and, and really ignoring the possibility that something really awful could happen in Rwanda. And Emily Willard, how unusual it is that you cannot get these documents declassified from 20 years ago? That's definitely a concern, um, because especially with presidential records, um, 20, 12 years after the president leaves office, um, there should be an increased access to the information. And this 20 years expired last January. So we're still—it is very concerning that we're still um, having a hard time getting, especially the behind-the-scenes— You're talking about President Clinton. Yes, president, the presidential— um, uh, records from the National Security Council, where a lot of these decisions um, were likely made. Um, so it is concerning because, you know, 20 years after the fact, especially that the documents and the information is about. We're going to have to leave genocide. it there. Emily Willard, thanks so much for being with us, and Professor Scott Strauss of University of Wisconsin. I'm Amy Goodman. This is Democracy Now. Thanks for joining us.